Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, we will continue our lecture series in this uh, optimal control guidance and estimation course. And just uh, last class we have seen uh, uh, some of, I mean some details about other things, but this this particular course, I mean this particular class we will uh, uh, start this constraint optimal control. Okay, so, uh, so far we have not talked about this, this particular topic, uh, so next uh, couple of lectures we will see the what differences it brings when you put uh, constraints into action and when I mean constraints uh, it means uh, uh, inequality constraints. So, let us see a uh, first control inequality constraint and towards the end of this series of lectures we will uh, talk also about a uh, little bit about state con constraint problems as well basically. All right, so this is the outline of the topics that are lined up uh, in this particular lecture. First thing is a little bit motivation about uh, why we want to study again this constraint optimal control for problems. And as I told lot of practical applications demand that, that we, we formulate the problem in this framework actually. A little bit uh, brief summary of unconstrained optimal control just to, just to recapitulate certain, uh, certain derivation process and things like that, that will form the basis for constraint optimal control also basically. And then uh, what we will study in detail this particular lecture is Pantriagen's minimum principle in some sort of a generic framework. Then uh, probably this is this will be the topic of uh, this particular lecture, but subsequently we will also study this time optimal time optimal control of LTI systems in detail and especially this time optimal control of uh, double integral system which is a very standard textbook sort of uh, problem is kind of a benchmark problem nowadays actually. Uh, you will find this problem in many test books and uh, we will also cover this in, in fair detail which will uh, which will kind of clear our ideas what we are talking about here actually. That will be followed by fuel optimal control and as well as uh, this energy optimal control. So, there are various uh, practical problems which will demand this kind of uh, control system analysis and synthesis basically. And towards the end of this couple of lectures, we will we'll also talk a little bit on state constraint optimal control actually and how do we solve uh, or how do we propose solutions for, for incorporating this kind of constraints. All right. So, let us get started and this particular topic lecture as I, as I told will contain this first three topics, rest of the things we will study as we go along in, in next two lectures basically. All right, a uh, little bit motivation for why we want to study this topic. First of all, uh, as we know, physical systems are always restricted by constraints on both control as well as state variables. When we that is the reality, we, we cannot escape from that actually. So, let us see some, some few examples uh, uh, how it naturally pops up. So, first of all, uh, suppose you think uh, that okay, rockets are controlled by thrust deflection angle actually typically. So, either uh, the engine is uh, swiveled, the entire engine will be kind of uh, uh, swiveled uh, uh, in a little lateral directions. So, that if you if you have something like uh, let us say if you have uh, some rocket like this okay, and uh, you have something like a thrust coming out. So, this is the nozzle part of it. Now, if the nozzle is, is reflected like that or that, so then the thrust will be like this. Initially, it was like this. Okay, but uh, if the engine is, uh, I mean, if the nozzle is deflected, then the thrust will be like that. So that means it will still have a component in the vertical direction, but also have a component in the in the horizontal direction, lateral direction. So that particular component which will act here, and because C G is here, okay, it will it will act as something like a moment, and that is the mechanism for controlling the uh, rockets actually. So obviously, when you look at it, uh, uh, this uh, engine or this nozzle deflection that you are talking one of the mechanisms for, for thrust reflection uh, cannot be cannot exceed beyond a certain limit and typically the limit is also very small uh, and the limit is roughly about uh, 10 15 degrees actually. Uh, 
So, if you if you talk about a problem which demands something like 35, 40 degree of nozzle deflection, obviously that is meaningless because uh, we simply cannot uh, can't implement such a control strategy actually. And you can also think that okay, well, if his control is constrained, then the system may go unstable. Well, that that may not be the case because we are not talking about something like instantaneous effect and all that. I mean, the vehicle can still be stable, and then we want to have a course correction and things like that. And also remember, we have a long period of time to kind of take control action. In other words, even if the control saturates for some time, then eventually, if it comes out of the saturation, then uh, then it's as good as uh, a good problem basically. Okay. So, that is the whole idea of uh, uh, studying this control, I mean constraint control problems actually. Anyway, so that is one th uh, one example. The other is, uh, let us say this, uh, suppose you talk about aircrafts now, not necessarily rockets. Then you also know that aircrafts are, uh, are having this uh, uh, various control surface deflections, uh, especially uh, like elevator, ailerons, uh, and rudders, and things like that, and we have discussed about that in in flight uh, dynamics lectures. So uh, even there, the control surface deflections are typically limited to something like 30 degree, 40 degree, and all that. And just to make a, make your idea a little more clear, uh, we are talking about control magnitude constraint here, but the but in general, uh, the the control is also con constrained in its rate actually. Even the magnitude may be small. If, if the rate of uh, rate of change is very high, then that also is not acceptable actually. Okay. So the, the these are the things that uh, that kind of motivates. But we are not talking about rate of uh, rate of control constraints here. We are still con I mean we are still talking about uh, control bounds. So especially if you if you plot it, let's say if you if you plot the control variable, okay. Uh, u and then the, we are just talking about something like a u max and then there is a u mean here actually. Okay. Okay. So, the uh, what I am talking is in, in practical reality it can still be bounded, but the but the chattering can be there that means the rate can be very high and that is that is also not acceptable. Okay. And if it is not chattering and then something happens like this and things like that then then also it is not acceptable because of these regions are violating actually we, we cannot. Uh, I mean, these these are not acceptable controls actually. Okay, so that's what we are interested in. We are we are interested in having something which will which will talk about uh, some bound of u max and u mean, and the control solution will uh, will uh, lie between this u max and u mean. Okay, all the time, uh, especially until t equal to t f actually. Yeah, that's what we are worried about. Uh, t f can be as good as infinity also basically. Okay. Anyway, so this is this, this is the problem. Uh, these are the examples. Uh, control surface reflections are also constrained by hard, hard bounds. And then uh, uh, coming to the state constraints part of it, uh, let us say aircrafts cannot climb beyond a certain altitude, okay. Because if they keep on climb, then ultimately they will lose lift because of low dynamic pressure. As we know that uh, lift and drag are typically very strong functions of dynamic pressure, L equal to half rho v square into S into C L right if you remember the formula and it turns out uh, this this is the lift coefficient uh, is C L and the surface area is S but this part is something what is called a dynamic pressure. Now it turns out that rho is not a constant number rho is a function of height a rather a strong function of height external exponential beta S times rho 0 something rho C level that so, if it is like that uh, then obviously, as you keep on increasing height then this quantity what you see here keeps on decreasing very fast okay. and ultimately rho will be so small that your uh, L will be very small. So, then if you see the very fast principle that uh, that lift is uh, at least uh, equal to weight or more than weight. So, so, that it can it can be sustained or taken up in the air okay. this is uh, W and this is lift. If the lift becomes smaller and smaller, then W becomes larger, and then ultimately, what happens? If your lift is very small, W is very high, then this will start coming down actually. Okay. So you just cannot sustain the lift. That's that's why uh, state constraints are also important. This, and if you, if it is very low, what happens is your your drag is also a function of that. That means uh, drag is again half rho v square uh, into S into C D this time. And so it is again a strong function of this dynamic pressure. Okay, 
So, if it is very low then your rho is very high obviously you will uh, will end up with a lot of drag penalty actually. So, in the that is where your, your uh, I mean our aircrafts typically have something called uh, climb altitude basically like. So, it, uh, it is not very high ok if it is altitude uh, it should be somewhere I mean somewhere in the uh, there is a kind of uh, optimum altitude within which the aircraft should fly actually ok. So, then it then it is alright actually. So, then obviously, we need to impose a constraint uh, on the height part of it uh, height is a state variable in, in flight dynamics. So, that is where the, it is this is also necessary ok. Alright, uh, so let us uh, see the next point ok. All right. The next one is let us say robotic arms they are also constrained by physical limits on angular movements actually. So, that is also I mean it various various application is not just aerospace this first three are aerospace, but even if you go to non aerospace domain then also things uh, will pop up naturally actually. Then uh, we can also talk about electrical application where speed of the electric motor should not increase beyond a limit ok to prevent. Uh, I should not increase beyond a limit to prevent this uh, wear and tear actually ok. So, uh, that is also necessity and also current in the circuit cannot increase beyond a limit otherwise some components may burn out actually. So, we can list out a variety of applications I have listed a little from aerospace little from robotics and one from uh, something like mechatronics and or maybe electrical application and then you have this uh, I mean current circuit applications and, uh, and things like that. So, in in, uh, in almost all engineering applications so in real life applications constraint is uh, satisfaction of constraint is a must actually. In fact, in my opinion uh, constraint is first and then optimization is next actually. So, all right. So, that gives us uh, enough motivation to study this uh, this constraint optimal control. But unfortunately, what happens typically is uh, when we talk about constraint optimal control, the solution turns out to be uh, in open loop actually ok. So, that is why things are not very much in order unless there is a typical example problem where you can come up with some sort of a state feedback constraint, constraint I mean state feedback solution and all actually. But in general the solution nature will turn out to be something like uh, in open loop which is uh, not a very pleasant thing to see actually just, just keep that in mind. And uh, you can devise algorithms uh, and all that for in for generic systems, generic nonlinear systems, which will satisfy all these things in a state feedback sense. Is still, I think, in a in a big way, of an open problem actually. All right. So this. Uh, uh, so what is the summary of it? Uh, the question that you are asking is: Can these constraints be explicitly handled in the control design itself? I mean, in other words, one can also think: Okay, well, these are the constraints. And I can also have some sort of a penalty function in the cost function which will account for that. Now, that is the usual way of handling that uh, in general also to in many practical applications. The reason being if you if you can handle that through cost function let us say the control magnitude is high at some point of time then you increase the weight associated with the control function. In other words there is a term uh, I mean if you if you remember our LQR you know, things and all there is a term something like x transpose q x plus a u transpose r u. So, I mean this this is the term that we handle actually right uh, in the cost function ok 0 to T f. Now, here if you if you talk about this as a scalar quantity or r is a diagonal things and all that you can talk about something like q times uh, or q i times u i square actually. So, when u i is approaching to the limit ok then you can correspondingly increase q i so that uh, it, it will try to force it down actually. So, that kind of uh, ideas uh, are something called a soft constrained way of handling things or design tuning way of handling things, but that is not a very neat thing to see in a mathematically rigorous sense uh, we should rather handle it as a, as a state I mean as a control inequality problem straight away actually. So, that is what uh, uh, we are talking about here. So, the question here is can these constraints be explicitly handled in the control design and the answer turns out to be yes you can do it. 
and the ways to handle is uh, something like a soft constraint problem formulation which I just now described and then you can also handle this hard constraint wave for problem formulation which you are interested in mostly. So, the typical way of uh, classification of this problem is uh, in an explicit way uh, is something like this. So, you can talk about control constraint problems, you can talk about state constraint problems and you can also talk about mixed state and control uh, mixed state and control constraint problems. So, these three are uh, possible, but largely in this couple of lectures we will give emphasis on control constraint problems and a little bit uh, uh, on state constraint problems. Mixed uh, state and control are uh, kind of mixed algorithms and all that. Uh, you can uh, you can see some some references and things like that for for your own benefit actually. All right. So now going back to this a uh, little bit historical development and all that. Uh, as I told in one of the classes before, uh, the very first idea of optimal control theory in general probably can be credited to Newton all the way back, uh, where he proposed this uh, steepest. Uh, Recent gradient sort of I mean steepest descent methods and all that actually. Now, he was uh, not alone, but uh, this is uh, I mean very uh, long ago about 200 years back, he was not alone. Uh, there were uh, great uh, pioneers like uh, Bernoulli, Euler and Lagrange. In fact, we have been uh, talking about uh, EL equation, Euler Lagrange equations and all that actually. So, these are the contributions from these two pioneers and there were several others like them, but remember that was an era where computers were not there and uh, nothing uh, I mean the computational in intensive things were simply pipe dreams actually it is could not be done. So, but something uh, so it, it largely remained dormant a lot of people kind of started ignoring and things like that, but uh, towards the mid 1900s there was some uh, computers uh, revival or computers were getting developed and that was the time where the optimal control got a rebirth as well. So, something happens 200 years later. And these are the pioneers in the 1900s, which uh, which almost revolutionized this field actually. Okay, so this Pantriazin, a Russian mathematician, and a Belman, American, and Kalman is a European uh, person, but uh, then he migrated to US and came back to Zurich right now. He is in Switzerland now. But anyway, so Kalman's contributions are largely into linear systems theory and Kalman filtering in the linear system uh, framework. Wellman, as we know, is Hamilton, Jacobi, Wellman theorem, and all that, and dynamic programming. But here is this Pantriazin, a Russian mathematician, who almost single handedly kind of revolutionized this field in around 1950s. And a little bit on Pantriazin is uh, we will talk here because that is uh, his, it is his ideas that uh, we are talking here, constraint optimal control, and all that actually. Okay, so this is. Uh, uh, S. L. Pantriazin, he is uh, he was born in 1908 uh, and then uh, he survived until uh, 88 so, and uh, something like uh, he born in Moscow, Russia, uh, but he, the interesting thing is he lost his eyesight when he was about 14 years old due to some explosion actually. Uh, because of this explosion uh, even though he lost his uh, website, I mean the, sorry lost his eyesight. He continued uh, his exploration in, uh, in mathematics and especially was very much keen on uh, optimal control ideas and all that. Uh, so, he, he tried to pursue his passion, then uh, his mother came to rescue and then mother helped it uh, in a helped him in a very big way. In other words, so she was writing uh, everything and explaining the symbols and all that, she was not a mathematician by the way. So, this uh, in that uh, with that great help he continued his person and uh, he went in fact uh, become a very big name in uh, in Moscow I mean in USSR uh, R first uh, then later in the entire world as well. Okay. So, he had lot of this uh, significant contributions in topology especially in 1930s and 40s, but around late 40s and 50s he got uh, very much uh, in have uh, been interested in optimal control and that is where he revolutionized the field actually. Ultimately, he also headed this great institute, mathematical institute in, in USSR or currently Russia and he also focused on this theory of singular perturbed systems and singular perturbed systems in ODEs or ordinary differential equations and, to, and this is what you are talking here maximum principle in optimal control theory. We are talking everything in the setup of minimization, but when he studied he studied everything on, on maximization 
principle actually. So, one other thing I mean if you want to minimize a cost function it is equivalent of uh, maximizing uh, the negative part of it actually or uh, sorry the negative of the same cost function yes. Now, if you maximize negative z it is as good as minimizing positive z basically. So, the uh, this is what it is and then in around 1955 uh, that is when he formulated the general time optimal control problem of a difficult problem fifth order dynamical system describing optimal maneuver of aircraft with bounded control function and so far that was uh, never done before in a in a good analytical sense and people were almost uh, kind of stunned by this development actually. And uh, to, to invent this new calculus of variation which was dormant for a while he spent three consecutive sleepless nights as well and uh, he came up with this idea of uh, Hamiltonian formulation from the problem for, for the problem formulation and that is what we are talking about even in unconstrained domain I mean in unconstrained problems. First we establish that from the Hamiltonian formulation and then in this particular lecture we will see how to exploit that for control constraint problems as well actually. So, uh, coming back he spent uh, three consecutive sleepless nights and then this idea great idea came to him and then he proposed uh, this adjoint differential equation methods uh, this co-state equations and all that. And this is primarily because of this frontiersians development actually, a frontiersians contributions rather. Yeah. But as we as I told, he also contributions. Uh, I mean, he also contributed towards the singular perturbation theory, as well as uh, later on differential game theory, which we are not talking about. Uh, uh, any, we are not talking anything about that in this particular lecture. I mean, course really. But uh, essentially differential game theory some sort of an uh, extension of optimal control theory where essentially we have two classes of control variables. So, one favorable and one uh, kind of unfavorable ok. The one tries to minimize the cost function and the other tries to maximize the cost function. You can think of something like a air combat scenario where somebody wants to attack the other one tries to kind of get away from that to the maximum possibility. So, that means, one tries to kind of minimize the missed distance the other tries to kind of maximize the missed distance. So, both are uh, I mean the the, uh, the problem is in relative dynamics. So, both controls play play the role actually. So, that kind of problems uh, are called differential game theory and uh, it has taken a very a good impact on the on the model uh, war games and uh, war game solutions and all that and especially for air combat scenarios. So, if somebody is interested you can uh, you can see that actually some literature around that you can see. There are books available for differential game theory as well actually. And uh, the this prestigious uh, Lenin Prize, uh, he and his co-workers were uh, were awarded in 1961 actually. So that uh, that uh, great Pontryagin is one of the heroes of uh, this modern optimal control theory. And lot of this uh, development around optimal control is happening because of uh, his insight into the problem and his uh, way of uh, giving uh, rather simplified solutions. Uh, avoiding this uh, this EL equation sort of ideas and all that actually. The, in other words, when you follow this uh, state equation, co state equation, uh, and optimal control equation like that, uh, we do not really talk about uh, Euler Lagrange equation and all that. We do not, uh, even though even though we can derive these three conditions from the EL equation, we really do not worry so much about EL equations anymore actually, ok. So, that is the contribution from from Pontryagin's. So, let us uh, quickly see a little bit overview of this unconstrained optimal control that we have studied before and then we will come back to this constrained optimal control actually. So, so objective was uh, what we have been studying so far is to find an admissible time history of the control variable from T naught to T f which causes the system governed by this nonlinear system dynamics to follow an admissible trajectory and at the same time it should also minimize or maximize that means, it should also optimize a meaningful performance index of this form is the typically called Bolza class of problems which is fairly very much generic actually okay. and also forces the system to satisfy proper boundary conditions. So, all these things we have uh, seen before. Now, to summarize it has to have uh, it has to minimize or maximize a cost function of this form, it has to satisfy the path constraint and it has to satisfy the boundary condition uh, as well basically. Now, what we followed is we of a formulated an augmented cost function of this form and the dynamics part of it we went uh, we took it inside the integral the terminal penalty was still outside that is j bar and then we define an Hamiltonian which can does not contain any differential terms in the inside the 
integration. So, this only this part L plus lambda transpose f and then we put the define that as uh, Hamiltonian. Then you can continue our analysis for first variation and the first variation happens to be the first variation of phi then first variation of entire integral term, but then uh, integral and uh, uh, I mean the integration and this uh, variation they are commutable. So, the variation went inside and then uh, we expanded that and carry out this algebra of derivation and then this term by term we analyzed and finally, we we kind of analyze this as well through this uh, sorry this this is the term here ok. This particular term we analyzed in integral sense and then uh, uh, put some no variation in the uh, initial condition that condition gives us that variation of x naught is 0 and we continued this analysis and then finally, we combined all these things uh, all the first variation terms and then land up with something like that. Then we excited a theorem which tells us that if these equations are true this equation is true for all sort of possible variations then the only way it can happen is, uh, is when the coefficients are 0 and when when we invoke that condition we landed up this state equation because if you see this part this cannot be 0. So, this has to be 0, but x dot is del s by del lambda, but lambda if you go I mean you see the definition of lambda this is what it is. So, del s by del lambda is nothing but f and then f is I mean what we landed up is is same state equation that we started with actually. Then similarly, we we landed up this co state equation from uh, this coefficient being 0. So, this lambda dot is negative of del s by del x, then you have this optimal control equation coming out of here ok and then the boundary condition coming out of here actually. So, this is where uh, we observe that ok this uh, these two equations are compatible, this is a state equation with initial condition and there is a co state equation with final condition and hence it has this uh, split boundary conditions uh, and then this led to this so called two point boundary value problem and that is what you call as curse of, uh, curse of uh, complexity because of this uh, complex nature of the problem formulation actually. So, not only the, uh, the boundary conditions are split, but the differential equation nature itself is, uh, is opposite actually in a way. The state equation is stable, you will end up with co state equation being unstable ok that is a drawback actually. So, these things also we summarize there at that point of time and we told ok state and co state equations are dynamic equations and if one is stable the other, other one turns out to be unstable. And then if the optimal control uh, equ this particular out of these three equations optimal control equation is a stationary equation algebraic equation whereas, these two equations are dynamic equations actually ok. Uh, state equation develops forward because of the boundary condition uh, being given at initial condition and the co-state equation develops backward. So, this is known as curse of complexity and traditionally these two point boundary value problems uh, demand computationally intensive iterative, iterative numerical procedures which leads to this open loop control structure. All these things we summarized uh, long before uh, almost at the beginning of the course actually. So, this is what uh, will form the basis of our derivation ok. As you can see some of this first variation we made it equal to 0 and that is where we will see how this particular constant optimal control problem differs from unconstrained problems actually. All right. So, let us start uh, start studying that. Uh, so, what we are talking now is uh, control constraint problems essentially we are talking Pontryagin's minimum principle. And you can also see here that the uh, his uh, I mean his blind his eyes are not there. And the last of uh, I mean largely this material I have taken it from this reference, uh, but I will also list out one or two very early reference uh, including Pontryagin's own reference which is now available in English as well actually. Uh, we will see we will see that towards the end of this lecture basically. So, what is the difference here? Now, the difference is uh, so, what, what we studied uh, I mean uh, before is something like this. To find an admissible time history of the control variable u uh, I mean u of t where t belongs to t naught to t f which satisfies certain conditions here. So, we did not impose any condition on this u of t at all actually. It was unconstrained and it can take a very large value if, re, if it is so required actually. So, that part we are changing here ok and we are telling that the objective remains same for all the other things, but there is additional uh, condition out here for the for the control variable u of t. Uh, 
that means uh, to find an admissible time history of the control variable in this segment u of t or t belongs to t naught to t f where the norm of u of t is bounded by certain value or in component sense uh, the each of that uh, each of the component of control variable that is u j is bounded between its maximum and minimum value. This is the maximum value of u j and this is the minimum value of u j actually. So, with that condition that additional condition in action all other things has to be satisfied actually okay, that is a that is a different class of challenge actually. And again let me also admit here that we are not going to follow this very rigorous of uh, topological way of uh, dealing things uh, that the way Pantry has indeed. What you are going to do is a very engineering intuition and then if somebody is interested in, in rigorous things in mathematical way you can always see the reference that I will give it then actually. Anyway, so little uh, again going back to what we discussed before what do you mean by variations and all that. And uh, when you talk about variation in control variable, let us say we have a, a optimum control or optimal control this uh, thick solid thick dotted lines ok that is the optimum control that we have already found. But what do you mean by variation? Variation is something that that should happen around that actually that means uh, delta u can be u minus u star. So, what you are talking here is uh, this uh, this deviations being this if you take it together collect it at all point of time from t naught to t f there is nothing but the variation actually ok. So, this is this u star is an optimum control path or optimum control trajectory whereas, u of t is something that is close to optimum it is varying around optimum ok, but it is not really optimum actually ok. So, the, the, the idea is if you tell ok some something is optimal that means, if I take any variation around that that is going to give me non optimal. Okay, so, so, that is the concept of local optimum things actually. Okay. So, that is the whole thing that we studied before and this is what we, we can uh, summarize as well. Okay, that means, uh, if, if u of t minus u star of t magnitude wise it is less than epsilon, epsilon being a small positive quantity and then all that it should happen is if I evaluate j at u and then j of u star then j of u minus j of u star should always be positive 0 I mean greater than equal to 0 no matter what kind of variation we talk here. Remember u is nothing but uh, u star plus delta u. So, irrespective of whatever is the delta u then this a condition has to be satisfied then only you get this uh, local minimum. If it happens otherwise we get a local maximum and also remember if epsilon happens to be arbitrarily large that means, uh, there is no bound on epsilon and all that obviously, the solution that you are talking is actually globally optimum. We, we have discussed all that in one of the early lectures uh, in this course. Now, uh, here is a problem actually. So, what is happening is something like uh, u is ok u is u star plus delta u ok. However, uh, ok. Uh, so, this delta j I can always uh, interpret as something like j of u minus j of u star ok that has to be greater than equal to 0 and and here remember the u can be a general vector variable sort of thing. So, if I if I write this de delta j which is nothing but the first variation plus higher order terms. So, if I neglect higher order terms then I will end up with this first variation which is uh, which is uh, written something like this. So, del j by del u into uh, into delta u basically ok. However, when the norm of u is uh, is constrained that means, norm of u is, uh, is less than equal to u the problem the core issue here is this delta u can no longer no longer be arbitrary actually ok. That means, we cannot take arbitrary variations around uh, the boundary values actually and that is where this, this uh, fundamental philosophy that we assumed in the derivation process while deriving this condition. Okay, this particular del s by del u equal to 0, we assume that this can be arbitrary and hence this has to be 0. Now, this is no more arbitrary. So, obviously, we can talk del s by del u equal to 0 and that is the very fundamental drawback of or ra rather challenge of this uh, constant optimal control. So, we cannot tell del s by del u equal to 0. Okay, now, let us see a little bit pictorially what is happening here. Let us say this is the constraint boundary. Okay, and this is what uh, we have already found is something like uh, u star. Now, if I take a perturbation delta u over u star, uh, 
and then here I have no problem because I can go both ways, here I have no problem I can go both ways at least there is some perturbation that is allowed in both ways. But on the boundary okay, this, this cannot happen because this perturbation on the top side is not, not allowed whereas on the bottom side is, is still allowed actually. Okay. All right, so delta z, but remember delta z is zero varied only if uh, u star lies within the boundary actually. Okay, here you are just generic. Uh, this delta z we are talking is a function of some generic control variable only. It's it's not yet tied up with uh, optimal control per se. Basically, we'll see that in in a second. So the problem, I repeat, uh, it is. I mean, it is allowed. Both side variations are allowed here. Both side variations are allowed here, but here it is not allowed. So only one side variation is allowed, actually. and that is where the coefficient cannot be zero. We have to do something else, basically. All right. So if we, uh, but this condition is still there. Okay. This has to be satisfied because if you really talk about u star as the optimal solution. Then, uh, if you talk variation of delta z around uh, this u star in, in allowable variation, actually, it is not just arbitrary variation, but if you talk about allowable variation, even this uh, this uh, bottom part of it and all that, actually. Okay. So, even if you take allow allowable variation, okay, then this delta z with respect to all that has to be positive, actually. Then only you can talk that u star is actually an optimum value or that is the value which leads to minimization of u, uh, minimization of j, really. Okay. All right, let us go back to our derivation of unconstrained problems. Uh, so, here we had something like this delta j is given in this big expression and now we are telling that okay, wait a second, we can actually think of this uh, like this actually. In control constraint problem, variations in co-state can be arbitrary. We are not bothered about co-state variation, we are not put any constraints on that. So, let the co-state be arbitrary and arbitrary variations can be allowed. That means, we can still talk about uh, this uh, coefficients of that uh, delta lambda whatever wherever it is appearing that can be 0 actually. So, that is why you are getting x dot is del s by del lambda and that is nothing but uh, f of t x u. That means, the state equation we got it back that is what uh, is also part of the formulation. Okay. Now, if the coefficient uh, if the co-state is also selected in such a way that the coefficient of delta x is 0. Now, delta x may or may not be arbitrary because delta u is not no more arbitrary, but uh, remember the lambda is something like a di a different uh, dimension altogether, okay. it, it happens in a different space altogether. So, the idea is if the co-state lambda of t is selected in such in selected in such a way that the coefficient of delta x is 0, okay. we are not telling that delta x is arbitrary and hence it is 0, hence the coefficient is 0, we are not talking like that. What you are telling is the delta lambda, I mean lambda is selected in such a way that this equation is valid still. So, then we will end up with the same coastal equation lambda dot is minus del s by del x. Now, even you can also talk about this boundary conditions are not affected by control constraints because ultimately the problem objective will be met and all that and hence uh, the transversality condition still holds good. So, lambda f is, is still there actually in this form. So, what is left out really? If you talk about uh, this del j bar ultimately okay, I think uh, a little bit uh, okay, del j bar then we will end up with only control terms actually right. Okay, del j bar turns out to be something li like this okay, I think it is also bar okay. So, delta j bar it turns out to be like this. So, what you are telling here is this coefficient is uh, 0 we got the coasted equation this coefficient is 0, we got the state equation, this coefficient is 0, we got the boundary condition. So, what is left out? We left out is only this one. So, let us keep it actually. Okay. So, this is where del j bar is, is this quantity actually. Okay. Now, here you cannot tell that the del s by del u is equal to 0, that is not uh, possible. So, what you are telling here is okay, we, say, we do not want to talk uh, independently, individually this term and all, but we will talk combinedly. Okay, that means, we know that this particular term that you are talking about, okay, we I want to see that uh, as it is actually together. And then as you know, the, we can all actually talk something like when delta u is small, you can talk about something like this also actually, right. I mean, this is actually this is more appropriate. The second line is more appropriate, the first one is an approximation of that actually, okay, first order sense. 
So, if delta u is small you can that these two are equivalent. Uh, so, we can still interpret that the entire term is something like this. So, as long as the we can make sure that the entire term is greater than or equal to 0 we are done actually. Okay. And here is also a small thing to worry about remember u and u star and all that what you are talking they are not point variables actually they are also functions of time themselves actually. So, here is the trick that you if you are in the if you are uh, serious uh, to see rigorous things probably you can see some references or, or in, in fact uh, the original work of entryism, but here you imagine something like this actually. Now, assume that this delta u t is arbitrarily small, okay. but this integral value has to be positive I mean there is no choice for that the only then you can talk about delta j being something like uh, uh, delta j bar uh, has to be greater than equal to 0 actually. Okay. Then only you can say that the we are landed up with optimal solution basically. So, if it is arbitrarily small okay, that means everywhere else let us say it has gone to 0. Okay, everywhere else this uh, this variation is everywhere else it is on to 0 only in this region it has happened some little bit of deviation let us say something like that. Okay. Everywhere else there is no deviation that is the variation that we are talking about actually. Okay. So, it is a very small variation sort of thing and if the even in that small variation uh, if this condition has to happen then the way it can happen is if the integrand value is positive all the time okay irrespective of uh, i mean whatever delta u it is but uh, we want the integral i mean the, the integral value after integration has to be positive so it's a path obviously and what you are telling is if we cannot exclude very small variations we have to include that also obviously in the allowable sense actually okay so if that condition has to happen then the this integral will be greater than or equal to 0 provided this quantity is, is greater than equal I mean is uh, greater than equal to 0 okay. and that is where we will end up this condition that uh, this uh, Hamiltonian with some control perturbation is greater than equal to the Hamiltonian without control perturbation and the optimal path basically. By the way in the entire lecture I will not uh, talk about x star lambda star and all that the some, some textbooks including I do will talk about x star lambda star to denote that uh, those are actually optimal values associated with u star, but just to minimize our notational uh, complexity we I thought I will avoid that, but uh, when you talk about u that is what primary important here. So, we will talk about uh, when you talk about u that is non optimal u and when is uh, u star that is optimal u actually and when is x and lambda by default they mean that uh, by applying u star I am generating x and lambda that means uh, it is not just x and lambda anywhere actually. Okay, so, just I thought uh, you just keep that in mind I thought I put a comment about that. All right. So, ultimately what you are telling here is uh, if, if you have the, this positive quantity satisfied so ultimately alternatively I can take this one in the left hand side and write this equation that means my, my Hamiltonian has to be minimized with respect to the u variable. Okay, so, then whatever u it lands up with that is my optimal control that is the bottom line actually. So, essentially the necessary condition for control, uh, constra uh, control constraint optimal control problems is to find a u star which satisfies this equation I mean this um, minimization condition really. So, you have to minimize this Hamiltonian with respect to this constraint space and then whatever control turns out it turns out to be optimal control. As you remember all other con uh, conditions are already satisfied state equation satisfied, co state equation satisfied, boundary condition also satisfied. The only thing that is not satisfied is this del s by del u equal to 0, but the optimal condition is satisfied optimal control turns out that uh, instead of making it equal to 0 we have to just do minimization of Hamiltonian within the constraint space. Now, if the constraint space happens to be large enough and this, uh, this is almost invalid then obviously, this minimization tells us uh, static minimization condition tells us that the first uh, derivative of, uh, of the gradient of, uh, of h with respect to u has to be 0 del s by del u equal to 0. So, that means, if it is unconstrained problem we still use this del s by del u equal to 0, but if it is a constrained problem we will go ahead and, uh, and minimize the Hamiltonian within the constraint space actually. So, that is the difference between the two approaches actually. All right, so uh, that's what I summarize here. It tells okay, how do you solve a um, given problem? Uh, 
first we go ahead and define the very similar uh, Hamiltonian that we defined before L plus lambda transpose f. Then we still use this uh, the state equation, co state equation and boundary condition as it is. Whereas, the optimal control equation we change a little bit and tell it is to the way all that we do to need to do is to minimize the Hamiltonian h with respect to the constraint control that means, with respect to u, but u has to be constrained within the space that is allowable actually. That means, the Hamiltonian with respect to u star evaluated with respect to u star has to be less than equal to Hamiltonian evaluated with uh, without u I mean without u star means any other u basically. Again there is a small notational um, difficulty here sort of thing just to simplify things and all I have not used x star lambda star in, in this notation actually. In a in naive book, you will see this uh, star values everywhere and all that. Some books prefer to follow that, but I thought I will ignore that here. Anyway, so this uh, uh, these are the boundary. This is the procedure. Everything else remains same. Only the optimal control equation takes a little bit different, and that different results in a huge different later in the solution part of it. But still, it tells us that okay, uh, uh, del s by del u is not equal to zero. However, the Hamiltonian needs to be minimized with respect to the control variable in the allowable space basically. Okay. And you can now see that this this framework what we discussed before in the Hamiltonian of, uh, method of what Pontryagin gave a uh, state equation, co state equation, optimal control, boundary condition like that then constrained optimal control becomes so much easier to handle actually, so much easier to see that so what, what we need to do. Some uh, little bit important observations uh, okay, so the, the optimality condition this one what we just talked about uh, is valid for both constrained equation and unconstrained equation I mean both constrained and unconstrained controls uh, problems. Whereas, this this particular equation del s by del u equal to 0 is valid for unconstrained systems only. So, what I mean is again this del s by del u equal to 0 that becomes a special case condition where the control is not really constrained. Okay. Second point is the results given uh, are only necessary conditions what you see the sufficiency conditions is a different ball game altogether and we are not even talking about that. However, if it is unconstrained problem then one of the sufficient I mean the sufficiency condition turns out to be something like this del square s by del square should be positive definite matrix, but uh, but if it is a constrained problem uh, this this is not valid you have to do several other things and, uh, and again I am not going to discuss anything here actually. A simple scalar algebraic example uh, just to kind of demonstrate your ideas a uh, little bit clarity sense. So, let us say we, we have satisfied everything else and landed up with, the, with this Hamiltonian uh, with respect to control variable when I see it turns out to be something like this. Okay. And in general you have this H uh, I mean this particular example H can be anything I mean H, H need not be Hamiltonian, but let us na, not lose the, lose the focus you so can still talk about. Uh, Hamiltonian is a function something like this uh, assuming that 6 and 7 this coefficients and this 1 here they are they are all uh, coming from this uh, say after satisfying the other conditions actually. So, our task is to find a particular u which will be satisfying the constraints. The constraint is magnitude of u has to be less than equal to 0 that means, the control has to be bounded between minus 2 and plus 2 actually. Then using the relationship between uh, for this unconstrained control what happens is del s by del u equal to 0. Okay. So, essentially del s by del u is uh, if you if you do that 2 u from here minus 6 from there so 2 u star minus uh, 6 is 0 that means u star is 3. Unfortunately, this u star equal to 3 is outside this domain it is not possible to take except this solution. So, we can talk about that as a, as a solution for the variable. Picturally, this is something like this. If you picture this uh, h of u, that quadratic function, then this takes something like this shape, okay, in the in the positive side of it, and then negative. This is the admissible control actually. Okay. So what uh, what turns out to be is obviously this point uh, uh, as a free. Uh, if you don't put any constraint, uh, like uh, as unconstrained solution, u star is three, which is something here, which is picturally clear as well. But unfortunately, it turns out to be outside this domain. Only this domain is is admissible actually. So what we find out this, uh, then all that you tell is okay within this constraint space, what that particular value which leads to the minimization of my Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian function. So within the constraint space, 
this is the point where uh, it is minimized the Hamiltonian value takes a very minimum value at this point of time within the constraint then hence u star equal to 2 not 3 basically ok. And you can also see that in this case the, the admissible optimal control u star uh, they can also that can also be obtained through the static optimization results using this KKT condition that uh, Carus Kuntaker condition if you apply very rigorously we will ultimately land up with the same value and we have discussed about static optimization problem at the very beginning of this course. Uh, you can uh, verify that if you want to. All right. Uh, if the constraint has been something like this rather let us say you uh, norm of u is less than equal to 3 then you are lucky because u, st uh, u star is 3 is still allowable actually. Okay. But unfortunately many practical constraints are not large enough to incorporate uh, or to pose the problem as something like uh, an unconstrained problem in general because the bounds are too much too far away. But having said that uh, there are also many problems uh, which will satisfy that and there are also many problems where you can actually do it in a soft constraint way that means uh, increase the weighting when control approaches the boundary that is the that is the method. And once you do that there are certain nice things that happens to the cost function, cost function still retains the quadratic nature for example and hence convexity and things like that and uh, also that becomes much more easier to get this uh, this state feedback solutions and all that actually. However, also remember that unfortunately many problems will demand that you do somehow explicitly address this issue ok. So, that we do not turn into more too much of tuning exercise and the tuning exercise unfortunately happens to be case by case. That means, if you start from this one particular initial condition somewhere down the line you may exceed the bound actually. Now, if you increase the weighting at that point of time if you try with a different initial condition the value can be high at a different point of time. So, you will be puzzled to where to jack up where to come down and all that actually. So, those are the difficulties of tuning in that the, in that other approach. Whereas, if you just incorporate this hard constraint the, the inequality constraint then that requirement is not there actually. And additional results and all uh, if the final time T f is fixed and the Hamiltonian does not depend on time T explicitly then the Hamiltonian must be constant along the optimal trajectory and that is true for constant control constraint problem as well ok. Uh, if it is a not to control constraint that is also very much true basically. Uh, I mean essentially because const constraint problems are uh, are subset of the unconstrained problems actually. And as a corollary of that if the final time is uh, uh, free ok, then what happens if you I mean this constant becomes 0 as t equal to t f typically if you have a quadratic function things like that. So, there is generalization of that result is uh, if the final time t f is free and the Hamiltonian does not uh, depend on time t explicitly then the Hamiltonian must be identically 0 along the optimal trajectory ok. So, that uh, that is there basically. So, we have proven that in fact we be before uh, I think probably about lecture number 8 if I remember that. So, this theorem at that point of time talked something like that remember still it is unconstrained problem I thought I will recapitulate a little bit before uh, going further. So, d h by d t is del h by del t plus all these terms x dot transpose time del h by del x u dot transpose del u is del h by del u plus lambda dot transpose del h by del lambda. Now, if you combine these two terms uh, using this fact the del h by del lambda del h by del lambda is nothing but x dot and this is this trans this is a scalar ultimately. So, I can reverse the th things. So, then I, I do that here and then combine these two. Now, what I see here is this term is 0 because optimal control equation is 0 remember it is a unconstrained problem. So, that is 0 and this is also 0 because lambda dot is minus del h by del x actually. So, that this term also cancelled off. So, d h by d t essentially turns out to be del h by del t on the optimum path ok and uh, that is the reason both actually like uh, if you del h by del t if d s by d t is del h by del t and then what you are telling here is Hamiltonian is not an explicit function of time that means del h by del t has to be 0 basically. So, if the, if the del h by del t is 0 then d s by d t is also 0 and hence the result actually ok. So, that is a very simple proof for unconstrained thing for constrained thing similar things uh, do exist you can try for arguing out yourself or you can see some reference actually. Uh, 
So, in conclusions about uh, this particular lecture, just remember that physical systems are always restricted by constraints on control and state variables both. And in this class, we studied about something like a little bit uh, brief summary about uh, constraint of unconstrained optimal control, just to recapitulate the ideas that we talked uh, long time before in one of the early lectures. And then we try to kind of correlate and try to de derive this Pontryagin's minimum principle in some sort of an intuitive argument actually. And in that actually is a very generic sense what you are talking here. Instead of del h by del e equal to 0, we talk about uh, the minimizing the Hamiltonian within the available constraint space. Okay. And also remember that uh, nowadays this uh, static optimization uh, numerical procedures are very strong. That means, even if you put a put a constraint like that, they are going to solve it very fast actually. So, I mean I am not telling that it, it can be solved in real time and all that is a different ball game. And in fact, this uh, pseudo spectral method of solution and all they, they are actually in fact talking about uh, it can be handled online also, it can be that fast basically. So, do not get worried that uh, okay, just because it is constraint problems, we cannot uh, solve it fast and all that actually, it can be done probably. And the next two classes, we will study about various application problems uh, and towards the end of the lectures, we will talk about state constraint optimal control as well. And these application problems will typically three classes, uh, time optimal control including a double integrator problem, then fuel optimal control problem as well as energy integral control problem. And especially in the framework of uh, linear systems actually, because that is where state feedback the ideas can be brought in and then you will see it may result in discontinuous controller, but it will satisfy the bounds actually, that is that is more important actually. Okay. All right, so with that comments, uh, I will uh, stop it, but before that uh, there are some references uh, as I promised. Most of my material will be taken from this particular book for these two, three lectures uh, DS92. Uh, and then I suggest that uh, many of you can actually buy this book. It is a, a western print and uh, somewhat uh, economy print and all that are available now. Probably you can buy this book as well. Okay. And these are two uh, very early references and this is uh, the Pantyazin's original work translated in, in uh, from Russian to English. And it is available uh, uh, in 1962 edition sort of thing. I do not know whether it is really available to buy or it is simply available online free or something that uh, that I have not checked, but you can uh, go back and check it yourself whether it is really available. And also remember the, the readings will not be in, in engineering sense. If you are very much math oriented and you have sufficient mathematics background in topology and all that, you can probably think about studying that and understanding that in a good way. And somewhat a simplified uh, treatment is done in this, this particular book, but this is also not a very recent book, this is also something like published in 66. So, but still I think it in some form or other it may be available over the internet or maybe be some uh, Dover, Dover press or something, if they come up with some uh, old classical books uh, in the, the cheap uh, price versions and all that. So, maybe it is available or not, I do not know, I have not checked it, but you are welcome to check it whether it is available somewhere and you can buy it actually or you can borrow it. Or, or you can download and print out or something you can do that actually. All right, we will uh, we'll, uh, study more in the next two classes about uh, these problems, but for this particular lecture I will stop here. Thank you.